After a win over Pitt, it's on to Georgia State, and Trey is emotional. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not. <laughs> Trivia question. Penn State's played football for 115 years, back-to-back -back games against the Panthers, Todd. Yeah, how about that? Is this the first time? Probably yes. so. Wow. And guys, to, to well, rip off. He came in prepared. <laughs> he, did. <laughs> he did. And, you know, to rip off one of the most epic post-game sound bites, this Georgia State show is as significant to us as the Pitt, Pitt show was, as the Akron show was. <laughs> We're bringing it on the blue-white tailgate again this week. <laughs> And we welcome everyone to the Blue White Tailgate Show. Todd, just so you know, our accountants do say is as significant as the other ones. They, would, they didn't give us less for the show. <laughs> okay. Uh, they, they beat Pitt. They win by 19 points. Not one time, except for the opening drive, did Pitt have a chance to get the football and take the lead. Zero. So why is everybody, eh. I, I think the buildup of the game was because everyone wanted to create, you know, basically talk about having a rival. I said on this show, I thought we win by more than 40. I was actually very surprised that Pitt played as well as they did. I mean, they're well, not bad. And I think we're just a little bit spoiled by the offense being so efficient. You know, the fact that I think they, they weren't clicking exactly right from the get-go. You know, Trace missed a couple of throws early on where it could have went for big chunk plays. It just kind of left, like, felt like there was some stuff left on the table. Yeah. But look, it was a solid, solid victory yeah. over your over your rival. And let's take a look at the AP poll, which doesn't figure in with the college football playoff, but is of interest. Penn State 5 this week. USC beat Stanford. Oklahoma beat Ohio State. Clemson beat Auburn. So is the problem here Pitt's perception compared to Stanford, Auburn, and others? I think they're just more willing to jump teams around right now in, in that particular poll. It's so early in the year. Look, they bounced USC back, then they moved them forward because they beat Stanford. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, obviously the pit yeah. perception, they're not ranked. It was a home victory. They were expected to win that game. You know, I think the fact that Ohio State lost, it just really bounced Oklahoma so yeah. far. I mean, that was such an impressive victory for the Sooners. It's going to be interesting right. to see how that plays out for right. Penn State later when they go to Columbus. And they should. They should have bounced. I mean, that's great Absolutely. win. Go on the road and win, win a game like that. That's impressive. Uh, James Franklin on the aforementioned uh, quote by Todd after the game on Pitt <laughs> and Akron. Guys, I know last year for their win it was like the Super Bowl. Um, but for us, this was just like beating Akron. Yeah, you guys, I, I've been saying for two years, so you can interpret it however you want. I've been saying for two years that each win is like the Super Bowl for okay. us. So you can interpret it however you want. And he's, he's been consistent on that the entire time. I mean, you know where that comes into play? That does not come into play before you play Pitt or Ohio State. It comes into play when you play this week. Yeah, I mean, people keep talking about this. It's so ridiculous to me. <laughs> I mean, I played for a guy, Joe Paterno, okay? And, and he, I mean, literally every single game we played, we were like playing like the Green Bay Packers of the 60s. Yeah. They were the greatest Temple team, the greatest Rutgers team. And he always said, just worry about what we're doing right now. Don't worry about the following week. And now James is saying it. And it's like people are like hanging the guy. It's ridiculous. Well, schedules are coming out. 20 and uh, 21 are out. And with a look at our PSECU pregame update, Allison Luthman. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm Allison Luthman with this week's PSECU pregame update. Now, we talked last week about being excited to follow Saquon Barkley's awards throughout the season, and he has not kept us waiting long. He's been named to this week's Hornock Award honor roll, which is given to the most versatile players in college football. Also, if you missed it, the Big Ten announced on Tuesday the 2020 and 2021 college football conference schedules. Penn State is scheduled to host five conference games in 2020 and four in 2021. Here's a closer look at what those schedules look like. 
The 2020 season opens against Northwestern, followed by a road trip to Michigan. This will be followed by a bye week before hosting Iowa and Ohio State in back-to-back -back weeks. Then they'll hit the road for a pair of games at Indiana and Nebraska before rounding out the 2020 Big Ten slate with home games against Michigan State and Maryland and also a regular season finale at Rutgers. In 2021, Penn State plays the first two conference games on the road at Wisconsin and Iowa. They'll return to Beaver Stadium to meet Illinois before a trip to Michigan State. The remaining conference home games feature Indiana, Michigan, and Rutgers, while the remaining road schedule includes a trip to Maryland and Ohio State. That's been this week's PSECU pregame update. We'll see you Saturday. Thank you, Allison. Appreciate that very much. All right, now let's get into a little bit of Georgia State. DeAndre Tompkins certainly has listened to his head coach, and he takes the approach to Georgia State this way. Uh, I mean, it's kind of hard playing a team. Well, not really hard, but it's kind of like a more uh, attention-based uh, detail when you play a team like Georgia State who, you know, you don't really have a lot of history or you don't really know kind of like the players who they play. But, um, you know, it just comes down to your preparation. Uh, we play to a standard um, no matter who the opponent is, and that's how we go out and attack every week. Interesting. We all know how good Wisconsin is, and a year ago in the third game of the year, Georgia State went to Wisconsin, and Wisconsin won 23-17. to So that's why you don't take anybody lightly. Yeah, or Appalachian State, you know, beating Michigan, right. whatever, 10 years ago this year. I mean, you, 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 you got to take the guys seriously. I mean, to me, again, I think that we're going to win by at least 50. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> to follow up on that, well, look, look, they are big-time athletes, and anything can happen in the game. You sure. know when turnovers happen, the pressure's right. on the home team to win the game. But if Penn State executes, they go out there and do what they can do, they're not, they should not struggle right. with this team. Right, exactly. And you just have to go out and take care of business. If you get sloppy, you let them hang around. The longer somebody hangs around, the more confidence they get. That's probably what happened in the Wisconsin game last year. We've referenced the offense a couple of times, so now we're going to take a closer look at the Nittany Lion offense as we continue with Blue White Tailgate after this. Well, remember in the preseason, we kept talking about expectations for the team. How high are the expectations for the team? Well, if there's one area in the football team that has expectations up here, when you turn in a good performance and not a here performance, yeah. what's wrong? Yeah. Yeah. So, Trey, what's wrong? Well, I, I just <laughs> I think it's ridiculous. I mean, you think about it. We were talking about this in the, in the pregame show um, or pregame meeting. If you would have said to me two years ago or three years ago, we scored 33 points, beat Pitt by 18-19, I mean, I would, have been, I would have been like, that's not going to happen because we're not ready for that. So it's kind of like the game was never in doubt, and yet the expectations for the team is they keep comparing with the 94 team. Todd, and it's just not fair. Well, and this is the ninth consecutive game they've had 30 or more points. The first yeah. time since the 93-94 team that did it 15 times in a row. So looks to me they're going to get to double digits with that streak, certainly to get to 10 with Georgia State. So, yeah, as we mentioned before, not spoiled necessarily, just, you know, the expectations. We've seen this offense high octane when it's running high energy, and it was just a little bit off there. They left a lot of points, as I mentioned before, yep. on the table. Yeah, they did. And, but, you know, the interesting thing is they had the ball, what, 21 minutes? So they averaged 1.5 points a minute, <laughs> yeah. okay? The opponent averaged 0 0.4 per minute in time of possession. All right, family clothesline, player of the week. Oh, I don't know. Let's see who should we go with. Well, how about 26? I like 26. <laughs> Let's go with him. Saquon Barkley, just another day for him where, what do you got, 13, 14 carries, 84 yards. What's interesting, though, is that the really good running backs in today's game, guys, are the ones that become important in the pass game. Yep. And that's where he is. Complete mismatch when he's out in coverage. I mean, he made just such look at that double move right there. It just loses the linebacker, and he is never within five yards of him. But, you know, that's a really good point that you make on that, Todd, because what happens is this, is that when you look at a guy like Barkley, a lot of backs just kind of float out of the backfield, get into the flats, circle out. He runs routes. Oh, yeah. That, that may, you're a linebacker. You know how difficult yeah. what would it be to cover. You didn't face a lot of guys that ran routes. Yep. They did a lot of floating. If a guy ran routes, how tough is that? Well, it's really difficult. I mean, the fact is he, you know, the, the one thing I will say about Saquon, and I, th I think he needs to, to work on is his blocking. Yep. But, I mean, when you see him, when you see him in, in, in running the ball, running the routes, 
it's speed, it's out of the gate, 100%. He's, he's you know, he's really moving and he's, he takes it very seriously. Interesting, in the post game with us, <clears throat> with Jack Ham and myself, he mentioned, he said, look, I'm not happy with my blocking. Mm -hmm. And he specifically mentioned that. Joel Confer, drive of the game for the Nittany Lions. Penn State is leading this game 7 to nothing. So the Joel Confer drive of the game is the one that makes it a two-score game, and Penn State maintained it the rest of the day. It's a 62-yard drive. Uh, let's start with 26. <laughs> uh, let's get the ball out to 26. Uh, I, I, so far, I like this. Right. Then Trace McSorley. Here's the big run right here. Todd, what about his ability to do this? I mean, Minnesota, he was able to get him into overtime on a play like well, that. Well, it's no, no mistake that it comes after two plays to Saquon Barkley. So you start to key in on 26, and it opens up that huge hole. And Trace is making some nice decisions when, he's talking, when he decides to tuck the ball and run. And then the touchdown pass to Mike Kosicki, his second of the day. Kosicki's a very tough matchup anytime. That made it 14 nothing at that point. Pitt never got within one score the rest of the day. Yeah. Never, I mean, down within one score, let alone, you know, it was a two, three score game the rest of the way. It really was not as taxing as some would make it believe. It, yeah. it was never in doubt after that point, and some would say it wasn't in doubt before then because they just couldn't put the ball in the end zone. And we talked about that last week, how important it was for the Nittany Lions to get six points as opposed to settling for three. And, and that, you know, if the offense wasn't as efficient as you wanted to see them, right. they still put the ball in the end zone right. and put the points and on the board. And no, there's no doubt that there parts there was a half tick off yeah. here and a half tick off there. All correctable stuff, so. Yeah. DeAndre Tompkins, all right, third down. Penn State have, it was 4-12 and third down. They're 7-21 in the season. They were actually better on third and short this time. It was actually third and long they didn't convert, but DeAndre Tompkins knows to keep drives alive. They have to be better there. Uh, just execute. Um, we know our details. We know our assignments. Uh, we just got to go out there and execute against uh, difficult looks. Uh, we know teams give the most difficult looks on third down, so uh, we got to be ready for, ready for that and prepared, uh, and that just comes down to our execution. And you know what that guy did on Saturday? He blocked really well all day. I mean, wide receivers blocking, that's where big plays happen in the run game. Wide, and he blocked really well, Tompkins did. Well, it's a very unselfish offense. And one of the things, you know, if you're not scoring as many points as you want to score, one of the things that really played a big part of this game was field position. So even if your offense is not going down and scoring, they're at least – gathering two and three first downs. We talk about maybe stalling sometimes on third down, but it allowed Blake Gillikin to put the ball inside the 20, and we won the field, you know, Penn State won the field position battle easily, which when it comes down to it, you get in conference play, that's going to be a big factor later on. You get in a little tighter game. That's a great point because Penn State's average drive start was the 36-yard line. Pitt's average drive start was the 18-yard line. You do it over a dozen possessions, you're talking that's 340 yards difference on field position in the game. It changes everything. All right, the Penn State defense. Well, along the way, they were out there for 38 minutes. But in the 38 minutes, they gave up 14 points. We'll talk about them as we continue after this. Well, the Penn State defense spent a lot of time out there, 38 minutes, something we had talked about last week in the show, that Pitt would try to play keep away yes. with this thing, and they ended up doing it for a period of time. But they had a long field, as Todd pointed out in the previous segment, almost every time, Trey. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's like if, if, if you have an offense that doesn't throw the ball particularly well, and I think Pittsburgh really didn't throw the ball well, although I think the second-string quarterback should be the starter, just my own opinion. No, I think a lot yeah. of people yeah. think that. Right, right. Um, you know, the fact is that it's difficult to go 80 yards, you know, and, and try to get something done. I mean, they, they're not going to do it in this day and age of, of big-time football time. If you were wondering why Sam Darnold took the job at USC, I think we all got a good indication <laughs> yeah. why Max Brown didn't stick at USC. I think it's impressive the kid's been a captain, you know, for the Trojans yeah. and was named captain right away as a graduate transfer for Pitt. But he was not very mobile, could not throw the ball downfield. And the defense did a great job of bending but not breaking. And, you know, when you're out there 38 minutes, you're rotating all those bodies in. They were able to stay reasonably fresh and come up with big stops on third down to make mm -hmm. them kick field goals. Which brings us now to our momentum moment, brought to you by Dr. Sorbera and the Sorbera weight loss system. All right, it happens early in the game, and here's Max Brown. Right, good ground level shot. And there's the interception by Grant Haley. Now notice who's there. Now notice who's in front of this play. 
Trey, you know the value of a linebacker that makes a good drop into yep. a spot. He has to overthrow Koa Farmer to try and feed it in there, and then Haley with all that speed that makes him play. Yeah, I mean, Koa Farmer is probably one of the best athletes on the team, and, you know, I really – I don't think he tackled particularly well, <clears throat> excuse me, on Saturday, but – and I expect big things from him. But that set the tone right away. Yeah. Right? Well, the momentum, I mean, it's perfect to call it that. The place erupted when Grant Haley intercepted that ball. And it wasn't just intercepting it. It was going down and setting them up for an easy touchdown. The return was, was excellent as well by Grant Haley. And, oh, we've seen a couple of returns from him in the <laughs> yeah, past, yeah. haven't we? Yeah, he yeah. seems to make yeah. it work. He seems to be around that ball in, in big situations. <laughs> Which brings us to the family clothesline defensive player of the week and the defensive player of the week. To us is Grant Haley, who actually had a really good all-around game. It wasn't just the interception, which was huge. He was just around the football all day. Pitt could do nothing with him all day. Yeah, I mean, he's a good player. He, he's, he's one of those guys who you're going to look back and look at his career and the amount of starts that he had and the amount of big plays that he's made um, throughout his career. And He's a very, very solid, you know, college football player. There, there's the sack off the edge yeah. off the corner yeah. blitz. Mm -hmm. It's what comes with experience, right? Sure. I mean, he's that yeah. senior. It's, it's, there's not really much you can throw at Grant Haley that he hasn't already seen in his college football career, and he's prepared and ready for it. Mm -hmm. Which then brings me to a guy like Marcus Allen. Same story. Another senior, 12 tackles, 9 solos. Yeah, he wasn't one of those guys who got 84 tackles and like <laughs> 70 were jump on pile. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. He had, 12, he had 12 tackles, nine solos, plus the safety. What are you seeing in him as a playmaker out there? Well, I mean, I think he's such a physical guy. I mean, just look at him. I mean, he, he's, he, he's very lean. Um, he's got a lot of mass on him. Um, he likes to hit. Um, the thing that concerns me is he's the leading tackler from last year, and you, you don't want to have your safeties being the leading tacklers yeah. you know, on your team. Well, if he tackles the way he did on that safety play, I'm fine with him making as many tackles <laughs> as possible because he shot right past the lineman that was trying to block him and got right in there. I mean, he did not hesitate, went right after it. Perfect form tackle. In fact, Nick Scott had a perfect form tackle earlier in the game as well, both of them with really solid hits. but. And Marcus is around the ball when he needs to be, and, and that was a big play, big play at the time. And something they have to do is they have to do a little bit better job of getting off the field, obviously. 38 mm -hmm. minutes, you know, you could talk about time of possession. Sometimes you know, the team with 21 minutes scored 33 points in the game and won by 19, but you, you can't keep putting your team out there 38 minutes. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you're just setting yourself up for it. There are a lot of bad things can happen when the other team has the ball. The longer they have the ball, the more opportunity for them to, you know, kind of take advantage of you, and and there's no reason for that to happen. I mean, we need to do we need to do better um, tackling, and I just, you know, again, we're not tackling very well. It's interesting. They pick out 199 yards uh, rushing in the game, but they only average 3.3 yards a rush in this game. A Koa Farmer knows. Hey, look, they just want to keep getting better every week. And there's one kind of drive where it was like 18 plays, and. Um, I think, you know, we, I mean, we had third downs in that series. We just got to get off the field. I mean, that's just, you know, playing, you know, looking at the details, you know, getting a run pass read faster, making so you can be, you can be at the ball faster, playing, kind of playing like anticipative defense. And I think that's one thing we need to focus on this week. I mean, they had, what, two 15-play drives. I think one ended in turnover or a turnover by Windsor, and the other one ended in a field goal. 30 plays, three points. Yeah, it was interesting. Coach Franklin said after the game it was a complete victory. And he just was, you know, he was very pleased with all areas on Tuesday. Backtracked a little bit from the statement, not to say it wasn't, there were things to work on, obviously. Right. But it was one of those things where each area, each phase of the game shined at the appropriate time when you needed it to. From the defensive standpoint, look, they did. They bent a little bit in the running game. So it's something to, yeah. to definitely work on as you face some of these big lines as you get yeah. into conference play and see what they can do. But, you know, they were able to rotate enough guys in there and get the job done and keep it out of the end zone. All right, so now let's talk about tackling. We've talked about this in other shows before. Coa Farmer with his take on tackling. Coach Price being on fundamentals, you know, obviously, like, the, you can argue, like, the game is changing the way around. Not a lot of guys are being tackled at practice. And that's why we have to work at the fundamental, you know, you know, tackle and roll, squeeze, you know, put your chest on, put your pads on, shoulders rolled over, you know. That's one thing that Coach Barr and his coaches have is really uh, focusing on. And that's what they do a lot. And look, the NFL and the NCAA, they've changed so many rules when it comes to this. 
it's the initial games of the season, Trey, where it suffers. Yeah, well, I mean, it's I mean, the NFL is almost unwatchable to me, but that's for a whole, a whole <laughs> different reason. But I, I do think that it's really it's really difficult to be a good tackler if you don't practice it. It's like anything else, Todd. I mean, you need to get a guy, you need to grab him up, and you need to get him on the ground. And if you're not practicing it. It's not going to work for you in the game. The interesting thing, too, is it works for the running backs as well. They don't get hit all, you know, yes. Saquon Barkley, the first time he was hit was in game number one. So they need to be prepped and ready for it, too. So they're just absorbing some of the tackles for the first time as well. Yeah, that's it. And it's interesting because I usually feel like tackling really improves around third, fourth game because now you've actually been out there tackling in other games to lead up to it. Coming up, we go to the film room. Todd and Jay will break everything down for you in just a few moments as we continue on the Blue White Tailgate Show after this. We are back on the Blue White Tailgate and we're headed into the film room with Jay Paterno, sponsored by Beer Belly Beverage. And this is one of those games, I mean, look, you, the game, the aim is perfection, right? But right. you never get there, so you yeah. always have plenty of material to talk about. And this Penn State pit matchup gives you plenty of material, positive and negative reinforcement. Yeah, today we're going to talk about what some things, looking back, what are some good things to take away from the game? What are some things Penn State needs to improve on? We're two weeks in, um, and as you start to look down the schedule, it, the climb is going to get a lot steeper. Maybe not this week, but certainly yeah, in the future. It's coming soon, though. Yeah, so it's coming soon. So we're going to talk about some good and bad. And we'll start on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, when we talk about the good and the bad, what's good? Barkley in the pass game, obviously some really big plays. The one thing is they got some of those shorter passes. They got him to do some better job blocking. We'll talk about that. Quarterback in the run game, McSorley's had a big impact. Third downs, got to do better on third downs. And the wide receivers got to come up and make some, make some plays, both blocking and in the receiving game. We'll talk about that in a minute. But first of all, the quarterback run game, going to talk about McSorley. Now, when you look at the third down and short, third and short is where McSorley's been really good. Three out of four times they've given him the ball. He's, or four times he's gotten the ball, three times he's made it. Here's one, he's a third and two, a little change up in the quarterback run game, a lead play by Barkley where he comes in and you see that uh, we go to the video here, you'll see how effective this is because everybody's keying on Barkley. And once you get to that point where the back has cleared the quarterback, those guys start to think pass, or they got to come up and play the quarterback run. He gets loose and gets him a big 30-something yard run, which led to a touchdown, made a 14-nothing game. Now, talked about the wideouts needing to improve, and I'm not going to get into individual names, but we got to do a better job uh, on the perimeter blocking. You can see we motion the, the motion uh, Barkley out here. These guys got to make some blocks to get him loose, and they tried this a couple times without a lot of success. But you can see both these guys can pick, beat the block, keep the angles, turn it back into this guy. We'll take a look at the video. This quick motion by Barkley, they throw the ball out. He's got him stride, got a chance. But again, because that block doesn't occur, they're able to turn it back, and now Barkley has nowhere to go. It turns into a loss. Now, it, in the past game, what, one of the things that stuck out on Saturday was the inability of the wideouts to get loose. So a couple of times, McSorley had to throw the ball away, had to run around, and probably because he didn't have anybody to throw to. Now, here you're going to see they're going to lock everybody up, and then uh, McSorley's going to take a sack, but we see the end zone shot. Take a look at the video here. You're going to see both the sideline and the end zone shot. We show the video. Boy, he goes back to pass, and really there's nobody open. There's nobody free for him. Now, the left tackle gets beat, but when you look at the end zone, take a look downfield and see who's open. There are guys with Pitt running with everybody stride for stride. That's got to improve if they're going to have the kind of offense they want to have. So we'll switch to defense. Yeah, so ultimately, defensively, look, they keep them out of the end zone. That's goal number one. Keep them out of the end zone. Don't give them a lot of points. But they were on the field a long, long time. Had some difficulty getting off the field and did allow some rushing yards. So what did you see? Well, the thing you got to do is the linebackers have got to get off blocks. But let's talk about first the red zone defense. Let's go with the good. I'm a positive guy. I want to talk about <laughs> Great job in the red zone. Pitt got inside the 10 on two different occasions, three different occasions, only got two field goals out of it. You take a look here. One of the things, they force him into a third and long, and they do a great job uh, locking up these guys. Pitt has nowhere to go with this football except the most difficult throw the corner out and take a look at this one. They come back. You're going to see on the video, quarterback goes back to pass. Tight ends covered, the slot, uh, the receiver up to the top is covered. The outside guy is, they only got one guy to throw to. Really, there's only one guy he could go to. It's a great job by Penn State's defense. Now, the things that would concern me in the run game is when you get into a game like this with a team that runs the ball as much as Pitt did, your two leading tacklers were safeties. 
And you want those linebackers making more tackles in the run game. And part of it is they're not getting off blocks. You're going to see on this run play, they get to the second level. And part of that is on the defensive line. The defensive line has got to keep these guys from going to the second level. But when they get there, they hold the blocks and force the safety. Let's take a look at the video here. But you're going to see the tight end gets up, seals off the middle linebacker. The guy pulling takes the outside linebacker. And now the safety's got to come up and make the tackle. Uh, also, the other thing is the shovel pass. So when you look at the run game, the shovel is really a run game, even though statistically it goes under pass. But again, time and time again, Pitt hit this. Let's take a look at the video here. But again, you've got guys, you've got guys pulling, getting the second level, creating problems for them, and now you got again safeties have to make tackles. Linebackers got to make those tackles and make those things happen. And when you look at the run game stats, when you take a look at take the sacks out and you add this, the shovel passes, and Pitt got 255 yards in what essentially a run place. One other thing you wanted to mention positive-wise, punt coverage. Did Absolutely. a good job with that. Special teams did a great job. And take a look at this graphic that we got here. What Pitt, what the, the average field position between Penn State and Pitt, Penn State had 18 more yards per possession of field position, which comes up to 216-yard advantage in a game, which is a big deal. Did a great job covering those punts. And, forced Pitt to be in a long field all day. Yeah, that adds up. And, you know, even when you're stalling offensively, at least if you're moving it down the field and you can pin them in, Gillikin four times inside the 20. So Absolutely. special teams-wise, both coverage and the punter himself making a difference in the game. Absolutely. And I think what, what's going to happen now is, you know, this game's behind it. But, again, hopefully, you know, you win by 19, but you start to take away, like, these are the things we've got to improve on. And as you look down the road, whether it's, it's at Iowa in a week, in a week from now, when they're playing a team that wants to run the ball and hold the ball or when they get to Michigan, um, those are some things that Penn State can improve on to really if they want to have the kind of season they want to have. You know, and that game was announced as a night game. Not an easy place to play, especially oh, I, Believe me, I know from personal <laughs> experience what that game is like in a night game, so yeah. trust me. That's going to be a great environment. All right, Jay, thanks a lot. We're always smarter when we leave the film room. We'll be back with more Blue White Tailgate after this. Welcome back to Blue White Tailgate. We have Georgia State head coach Sean Elliott on the phone here with us. Coach, you guys had your opening game last week against Tennessee State. Now that you've had a chance to kind of look over that footage, what are some of the things that you liked and didn't like of what you saw? Well, I uh, certainly didn't like the loss. How about that? Let's start there with the first thing. And, you know, we, we turned the bo uh, ball over, I think, five times, uh, you know, in our first ball game, which is something that you, you just cannot do in any game, any sport. Uh, to have a chance and an opportunity to win the football game. So that was something that was really disappointing. And, uh, you know, we gave up some long runs, couldn't contain a quarterback, and uh, defensively, you know, played okay, but uh, we got to minimize those, uh, you know, the lack of containment of the quarterback and, and those fits in our run game. You know, on the other side, were there any, was there anything that you liked about what your team did? Well, I thought they competed to the very, very end. I mean, they, they, they played uh, – you know, played hard, and it wasn't for lack of effort by by any means. They they really fought to the end. You know, going into the last drive, we had an opportunity to go down and tie, and you know, potentially either kick a, a extra point or or go for two for the win. So, you know, we we fought for for 60 minutes. It wasn't a, a letdown of any sort at any time during that ball game. So that's what I was really pleased with. Last week was a bye week for your team. Is that something that you looked at as maybe favorable because it gave you more time to prepare? Or would you have rather your team had a game so that they could stay in a flow? Well, you know, we took the open week uh, and, and just built our football team. I mean, it was a, really a continuation of camp. Uh, we've, you know, the, the early, the open day came so early in our season. So it, it's more so just, you know, continuing to build our football team fundamentally and, and giving them more knowledge of the game so they can go out and compete against this great football team we're fixing to face. Your defensive line, Penn State's had a pretty strong offense so far, especially in Saquon Barkley. What are you telling them as far as preparation? Well, you know, at this point, we're, like I said, we're just trying to get our team better uh, fundamental-wise assignment-wise, and do things necessary to go out and put a good product on the field. You know, as far as uh, Penn State prep, to tell you the truth, we're, we're just trying to motivate our guys to get fundamentally sound and, and develop our football team to continue. So when we do uh, pull it in our full press prep, that they'll be ready to go for Penn State. Uh, you know, we, we've got a long way to go as a football team. And, and right now we have to continue building our team uh, and, and not so much preparing for the next opponent in this open date. Yeah, and Taz Bateman played pretty well for you last week. He led your team in rushing. What's his role going to be? 
Well, you know, we're going to try to get the ball in his hands. I mean, uh, we've got to we've got to make sure our running game uh, becomes up to par, to tell you the truth, because it was very, very minimal in the first game, and that's something you cannot have. Uh, so we've got to get him more involved in that aspect of it, and continue getting him uh, the ball in the perimeter and and, and screens and, and and routes and uh, just you know putting the ball in the playmaker's hand. Yeah, and you've brought up a lot of areas that you do want to work on this week. If you can kind of sum up one thing your team is really focusing on this week and next week, what is that going to be? I, I, I think playing together, playing as one unit, uh, understanding the game of football. I mean, there were so many critical times in our first ball game where I, I think had they just understand – uh, a little bit more about a defensive scheme and what they were preparing to see um, as far as, you know, angles and slants and, and various stunts they were bringing against us uh, just to learn the game of football. It sounds like you're really focusing just kind of on the basics. Is that a fair statement? Oh, without a doubt. You know, when you have a football team kind of like we have right now, that's what you've got to you've got to do first. I mean, you, you can't go and put the cart before the horse to tell you the truth. You've got to build with your team from inside out and uh, and make sure they understand uh, what's most important. And that's their play. It's not so much the the, the scheme of things uh, from a defensive or an offensive standpoint. It's it's their preparation, their knowledge, and their fundamentals. And as far as encouraging that building in the preparation and building the fundament fundamentals, have there been anyone on your team who's stepped up as a leader and is saying, hey, guys, this is what we need to do. Let's get going. Well, I told those guys after the first game, it doesn't need to come with a lot of mouth. I mean, uh, there's not a lot of talk that's going to change the things that we need to get changed. It's about more about action. It's more about, you know, doing the things that are necessary to build a football team, to build a strong football team that can continue on throughout the season. I told them we didn't need a whole lot of talk and there wasn't need, no need for a bunch of team meetings and player meetings and things of that nature. You need to go out there and, and do what we ask of you on the field and uh, in the classroom, and, and that builds uh, leadership within itself. Well, Coach, thank you again for your time. We appreciate it. We'll be back after this break with more Blue White Tailgate. Great to have had a chance to at least meet Sean Elliott in the previous segment. Then now let's talk about his football team. Let's uh, get into the Sean Elliott file, which was provided to us by our crack staff. Look, first game, of course, was two weeks ago for them, but he's worked his way through the ranks, including in South Carolina, to get here. It's a young program. It's only their seventh year, fifth year in FBS, but you know they're trying to get something started. Well, I, I think the interesting thing is that you know, Georgia is one of those states where, you know, the high school football is very, very competitive. They've got a lot of talented players. If they can keep some of those kids at home, um, you know, they're going to build, they can really do some stuff. It's fertile there. recruiting territory, mm -hmm. right? So we'll see how he can do. You know, Lane Kiffin's going to be battling the same thing where, where he's at, Florida Atlantic. You know, that's a, a scenario where there's plenty of kids that you can get, but you got to show a little bit of success. And, you know, Steve, I like your fun fact earlier about where they play. I think that's yeah. the most interesting thing yeah. about the program, Turner yeah. Field, right? Yeah, when the Braves moved up to Cobb County, Turner Field was left open, so Georgia State came in. It's now renamed Georgia State Stadium. But, you know, Georgia State is downtown. I've actually been to the campus uh, because when Penn State was in the 2001 Final Four in the Georgia Dome, they practiced at Georgia State's facility. So now they have this. So at least they don't have a stadium they can bring recruits to, and it looks like a big league place. Yeah, and it doesn't doesn't hurt. That helps them along the way. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's, I just can't believe that we actually talked about Lane Kiffin. Like, why would you even mention that guy's name? He is yeah. such a tool. Like, yeah. I just, oh yeah. my God. To get to get this reaction out of you. Give me, it's, <laughs> well, if it's Georgia State for crying out loud, Trey. I'm I'm reaching here. You know, I, we're talking. You are reaching, yeah. Lane okay. Kiffin. There yeah. are certain God moments sakes. where Todd Todd and I feel there's low front hanging fruit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We just Throwing let me you bones. Go. Is that what you're doing? We just let you go. It's just <laughs> poke the bear a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. Get him going. <laughs> they uh, used a couple of quarterbacks in the first game of the season. Connor Manning, who happens to be a transfer out of Utah, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, Winchester, the other quarterback, Aaron Winchester, was able to get in the game. And then they get Bateman, the running back, and then the wideouts. The wideouts are actually, in a lot of ways, I think the best part of this football team. You look at Penny Hart, he's got five career 100-yard receiving games. Uh, Chris Smith has a couple as well. So, I mean, it's not as if they're devoid of talent here. Well, when you are devoid of talent from an 11 versus an 11 standpoint, yeah. you've got to look at the mismatches or the matchups that you think favor you. And if they think it's going to be on the wideout, you know, that's what they're going to do. They're going to go to it over and over and over again because they know they're not going to be able to beat Penn State in the majority of the matchups. But if they can find one or two that they can exploit, 
they're going to yeah. stick with it. Yeah, they're an RPO team, and uh, Coa Farmer says defending the wideouts will be critical in this game. Yeah, they're fast and athletic, and um, you know we just got to contain those guys as much as we can. I mean, the the quarterback's going to give them the ball. You know, they're going to give give be given opportunities to do what they can do, and you know we're going to try to contain them as best we can. And then you go over to the Georgia State defense. Uh, Sullivan, the corner, is really good. Six career interceptions. The defensive end, number five, Turquoise, not bad. Um, seven and a half sacks. Block kick in the opening game. It's not, again, same story. It's not if you're looking at a team that is devoid of talent, but they just don't have enough of it. No, it, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's kind of like back in the day when we used to play Rutgers. Rutgers always had four or five, six very uh, serviceable guys. Um, talented, maybe, but the point is, Boy, is that you really, really, <laughs> you were searching. <laughs> no, I'm not searching. I'm just saying, I, you know, it's Georgia State for God's sakes. Yeah. Like, if we don't win by again, we won yeah. by 50. I, you know, what are we doing? Well, and they they really have trouble stopping people on the ground, and that's bad news when you got Saquon Barkley yeah. and Penn State's running game coming to town. So if they are somehow able to stop. The running game, and I, I don't expect to see much of Barkley. You can see a lot of Miles Sanders and Andre Robinson and the guys probably, you know, the, the secondary is not going to be able to stop Penn State's weapons, and who in the world is going to cover Mike Gesicki? So, right. you know, they got a lot of issues to deal with when you match up against Penn State's yeah. offense. Last year they gave up 206.8 yards per game on the ground for the season per game. In the opener against Tennessee State, they gave up 233, so that is an issue. But they don't give up big plays. That's one thing you look at. They do. They keep the ball in front of them for the most part. Yeah. And James, James Franklin does <laughs> respect that very much. And I think that's going to be one of the big challenges in the game. They do a great job of limiting big plays, and we do a pretty good job of creating big plays. So that's going to be one of the big storylines in the game. You know, you have a, a number of ways to create explosive plays. That's you know throwing it over their head, um, or that's breaking tackles. Go ahead, Todd. You, <laughs> you've, been, you've been aching. Oh, I was yeah, they haven't given up any big plays yet. I yeah. think those statistics are going to change drastically yeah. after after this particular game. But you have to. I think you got to get out of the gate in this game. You just establish early the who you are, you know, and then move on from there. The, uh, the one thing you get into a game like this, you always get concerned, you know, that they hang around. And the longer they hang around, the more dangerous they become because they get more confidence. Trey, you tell me, are these games more fun for the defense or for the offense? Because the offense sometimes they're arguing, hey, give me the ball. I want yeah. this touchdown. I want that touchdown. The defense just knows we're just going to physically dominate this squad. Well, that's what, you know, that's what we did. I mean, we didn't really have an offense when I played at Penn State, so we had to win all the games <laughs> on defense. So <laughs> it didn't really matter to, to us. I mean, we just wanted to put a beat down on somebody and um, – and, and I think that Penn State will. I mean, Penn State's just so deep right now, and there's, I, I mean, I can be find it very hard to believe for them to do anything against us. Were there moments where you personally just won the game all by yourself? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not at I all. I just want to check. Not at all. <laughs> no, no. No, it was handed to me by Jay. <laughs> <laughs> he just wanted to know along the way. <laughs> so, I mean, what's on your pregame tailgate this week? Pre-game pre tailgate for me is yeah. um, a lot of red wine and something to eat. Yeah. That's pretty much it. There you go. See, see, I want to get to, the, like, like the, his keys to the game. That's right. I'm sensing that right. might be for yeah. him the, your key yeah. to the game. The yeah. setup beforehand. The, yeah, the key, yeah, the key to the game is going to be the weather's going to be nice. Make sure I put enough sunblock on and make sure we have enough red wine at the tailgate. All right. Scheduling philosophy is something we'll talk about next as we get to the G block, our last block in a moment as we continue on Blue White Tailgate after this. Welcome back on the Blue White Tailgate. We get to the final segment. Let's talk about scheduling. They open with Akron, then they have Pitt at home as part of a four-game series, and then Georgia State before heading into the conference schedule. James Franklin on crafting a non-conference schedule. I have strong feelings um, about scheduling. Um, it's something that, that me and Sandy spent a lot of time talking about and discussing. You know, we're kind of looking at how the, the playoff system kind of played out last year. You kind of got a bunch of different scenarios to kind of, you know, factor in. Um, but again, you know, I, I think the playoffs are, are one factor that you got to look at when it comes to scheduling. Um, but I think the most important thing you can do year in and year out is schedule in a way that's going to give your team the best chance to win your conference. 
And he feels strongly that the conference is the avenue to get to the college football playoff. Especially when you have nine conference games that you've got right. to play. You know, you can only do so much with that non-conference schedule. I'd love to see another Power 5 team in there if you could at least get right. two out of the three in that particular situation. But we have what we have right now. And you really can't because you need two of those games to be absolute home games because you need that for your budget. I mean, for everyone who loves, and they do, women's soccer, baseball, men's soccer, volleyball, wrestling, you've got to be able to generate revenue. That seventh home game is part of the formula. Sure. I mean, yeah. it, it's just it's just the state of college athletics right now. It's about, you know, money and everything else, and, and that's going to be driving the, the programs that you have. I mean, I mean, Penn State's got 31 Division One sports. Yeah. I mean, not including all the club programs and everything else. And, um, I, you know, yeah. I, it's just it's just the, the facts of, Life yeah. right now. It just and I've had people say, "Why can Georgia play Georgia Tech?" Because the ACC and the SEC have eight conference games. They have four openings, not three. All right, the good, the bad, and the ugly. All right, the good is going to go back one week. The Tyler Olson moment in the USC game. Blind, uh, lifelong USC fan. He gets in the game against Western Michigan, snapped it right on the money. That doesn't tug at you, nothing yeah. does. Yeah, you look at the details. If you're not familiar with that story, go and read about it. It's fantastic. All right, I have the bad, and I'm going to bring up Baker Mayfield. Not his performance at Ohio State. That was phenomenal. It was planting the flag in the O, and that was great, but then he apologized for it. Don't apologize for it. It's, own up to it. Own up to it. It's emotional. He did it. He did it. Okay. Uh, to be honest with you, he planted it in field turf. Really? <laughs> okay, come on. I mean, he just played on it for hours. You can't yeah. put anything in it. Well, but that's why he goes to Oklahoma, guys. Oh, I mean. <laughs> so my, I have the ugly, and it just really pains me to say this, but my ugly is Notre Dame football. So Notre Dame football, Brian Kelly, the head coach, did you see what he said after the, after the in the press conference this week? The fact that they've only won double-digit seasons four times since 1994 and they fancy themselves as a national power it is a joke I mean Brian Kelly even Paul Feinbaum my little headed friend from Alabama <laughs> said that he's got he's on very borrowed time so my ugly is Notre Dame football all right time now to get to the picks all right <laughs> We didn't give you Notre Dame this week. <laughs> we start in the SEC, Kentucky and South Carolina, and Todd, that is yours. All right, two non-ranked SEC teams. Sounds like a snooze fest. I'll go with South Carolina because they're the home team. I'll go with the Gamecocks. All right, Jay, you got Air Force in Michigan. The Air Force Falcons invade the big house. Every fiber of my being wants to pick Air Force because I'm American, I'm a patriot, but the realist in me unfortunately has to go with the maize and blue over the red, white, and blue. Michigan in a big one. Jay, I've got Texas and USC. In the USC game notes, they say that they're 4-0 against Texas Lifetime. That's because they vacated the 2005 season. You vacate your wins, not the loss, okay? <laughs> USC wins this one. They'll get their fifth win over Texas. You've got Louisville and Clemson. Clemson at Louisville. Well, <laughs> Lamar Jackson won the Heisman Trophy last year. He's not going to win it this year. I think Clemson really takes it to them. Um, I think Clemson is a very solid program. I think Davos Sweeney's got those guys poised to, to, to really have another great season, and uh, I like Clemson. All right, keys of, the, keys of the game. I start first. Look, score early, get in front, don't get hurt. Pretty simple. That's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, how many, well, how many series are we going to have the – how, how many series are we going to have the starters in? Hopefully nobody gets hurt. A lot of the young guys get a chance to play a lot of football, and uh, I'll be happy to see those guys play. I'll go with ball security. Just hang on to the football. Not a lot of turnovers. And I'd like to see the defense create some more. Wrap the guy up and then pull it out. Let's start working on getting some fumbles and recovering them. Yeah, all's pretty simple to the point. I think it all comes down. Look, just get in there, do the job, get out. Yep. Right, as simple as that. All right. So, our accountants say that Georgia State to us was just as important <laughs> as Pitt and Akron. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it on Blue White Television.